It's a great pleasure uh, to see all of you on board. Uh, so I'm Haida Hassan, for those who don't know me, I'm the founder and director of the Canadian Practitioners Network on Prevention of uh, Radicalization and Extremist Violence. And I'm so happy today <laughs> to be able to host a very, very timely uh, webinar on the issue of hate and helping us uh, to understand hate a little, bit, a little bit more with five amazing experts on board. Uh, today, what we're going to talk about is really try to understand the manifestations of hate currently, the landscape of hate in Canada currently. We're going to talk a bit about the impact of hate uh, in our communities, as well as the government, uh, the federal government policy response. So I welcome uh, my, the four panelists, uh, Lisa Marie Iman and Peter Flegel from the government. Um, and Irfan Chaudhry and Dunya Noor, thank you so much, Community Voices, uh, to be there, working very hard within community organizations as well. And of course, uh, my colleague and friend, John McCoy, and uh, Jehan Rabah, Jehan, who will be the, the moderator, uh, the interviewer, actually, for the, for the panel today. So I will introduce Jehan and John, and then I will let Jehan introduce our four panelists and kind of tell everybody on board how today is going to, to, to take place. So I'll start uh, introducing uh, Jehan. She's the CPN Prep Systemic Review Specialist and co-leading with myself and the systemic review team, uh, the system systematic review on hate speech actually, and the impacts of hate speech on individuals, communities and societies. And Jehan is also the manager actually of the multi-institutional provincial research center called the CSLP at Concordia University, which is uh, a center that focuses on interdisciplinary teaching and learning. So the education part here is going to be a very, very uh, essential part. Uh, she actually manages the CSLP that's led by Vivek Van Katesh, maybe you know my colleague from the UNESCO chair, who also leads the Someone Initiative. I will introduce John and John, uh, the, the floor will be yours to provide us a kind of landscape of hate uh, across the country. So John McCoy is the executive director of the Organization for the Prevention of Violence, which is engaged in countering hate motivated violence and extremism in Western Canada. In addition to this role, John, John is the adjunct professor at the University of Alberta's Department of Political Science, senior research affiliate at the Canadian Network for research on terrorism, security, and society. So thank you again so much, uh, everyone, uh, to be on board. John, the floor is yours. Can you please share with us your vision, your view, the recent data about the landscape, landscape of hate in Canada today? Great, well, thank you so much, Haida. Um, and uh, thank you to the attendees for your, your time today. I, I've been asked to provide uh, an overview of the landscape of, of hate in Canada and to do that in uh, under 10 minutes. So um, if you'll forgive me, what I'm going to do is instead focus on highlighting some gaps that I believe exist in our current understanding of hate and specific gaps that hamper our ability to build effective approaches to prevention and, and to enforcement around hate crimes in Canada, specifically by the uh, criminal justice system. I'll start off with a question. Um, that I posed to myself when I started off on this enterprise, which is how can we best think about this phenomenon of hate? Um, how can we think on a simplified level about a complex problem in a way that's, that's easily understandable to a broad audience? Um, and, and what I came up with is this conception of, of hate existing or the landscape of hating, hate existing through three interconnected layers. So the first of these layers would be the baseline. It would be the grassroots and the general public where prejudice and hatred exist uh, among some, um, which has been expressed, for example, recently in Edmonton in the back-to-back -back or uh, more like back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back, uh, hate crimes that we witnessed at the tail end of 2020. Um, those expressions were reactionary, they were opportunistic, and they were targeted specifically on vulnerable and marginalized populations and individuals. Uh, in two of those examples, it was targeted on women who were wearing the hijab. The middle layer, if you will, uh, is the medium through which hate speech spreads uh, to the general population. And of course, most especially through the internet today. Um, if, if we think back to the 80s or the 90s in Canada and, and this landscape, 
Um, organized hate material would have to be distributed through a flyer in your mailbox, um, a flyer on a telephone pole, or through, say, a uh, telephone service. I think it's worth pointing out that hate groups and hate activists have always been innovative in exploiting new technologies. So whether that's the second iteration of the Ku Klux Klan benefiting from early cinema and the popularity of the movie uh, The Birth of the Nation in the early, early 20th century, or it's uh, groups like the now defunct Heritage Front using the first computerized telephone systems in the 1990s to deliver hateful material into people's homes. And now, of course, we have this online environment where there are both the organized activists and groups and a far more organic process that is taking place and feeding off of each other where we have layers, we have hateful ideologies like white supremacism or neo-Nazism. We have conspiracy theories like QAnonas, for example, which contains many anti-Semitic uh, anti tropes. And we have baseline prejudice all merging to distribute, redistribute and consume material on multiple overlapping platforms. And finally, we have the third or top layer of this landscape that are really the drivers, the organized groups, the online influencers, the demagogues and the far right politicians who are happy to use and manipulate our worst impulses to drive uh, their interests, specifically through exploding fears and prejudice at that bottom line of, of, the, uh, of that structure of hate that I described. So in this current context, in this current environment, this current landscape, maybe we shouldn't be surprised that according to some academics um, that uh, hate group numbers have more than doubled since 2015. And the first point that I'd really like to make here is that we don't have a sufficient understanding of this landscape or this problem. We focus too much on the symptoms of hate, if you will, and less on underlying causes of the disease. We don't have the research that can meaningfully tell us how those layers interact, how they reinforce each other. And we need to focus more on network analysis and identifying means of interrupting mechanisms for example, on social media platforms that spread hate if we are genuinely committed to combating this phenomenon, this complex phenomenon. Uh, the second point I'm gonna touch on is really turning closer to home here and talking about some of the tools that we have at our disposal when it comes to hate crime legislation in Canada. And I think a good starting point here is the legal definition that we have that really comes from hate crimes legislation that's embedded in the Canadian Criminal Code in sections like 318 and 319. And here we're focusing on specific acts, so like promotion of violence or harassment that targets people based on their identity. So some of you will be familiar with this. Um, you'll be aware that section 318 focuses on the willful incitement of genocide or killing uh, members of an identified group en masse. Section 319 on incitement of hatred in a public space, so for example, here we're talking about the distribution of hate speech or hate propaganda. Um, and, and if you take those two sections together, what we get is a high bar, a very high bar for what actually constitutes a hate crime in Canada. And I think it's fair to say for our police, for our courts, there's been a real struggle to balance essential constitutional freedoms like Section uh, 2B of the Charter, which of course is concerned in part with freedom of expression. Um, with hate crimes legislation, I think it's safe to say that, you know, the investigators themselves and, of course, the victims of hate are frustrated by our inability to lay charges in these cases. So this is certainly not my idea. Um, this is an idea that's under consideration by the government of Canada um, at the moment. And maybe this will be discussed later on. But one necessary step is creating more effective tools for enforcement and a starting point for that is a clear definition of hate, one that's adequate to deal with this dynamic and changing nature of the problem. You know, for example, what's going on in the online environment, and especially one that's consistent with Canadian jurisprudence, because we know inevitably these cases will be appealed and they will make their way to the Supreme Court of Canada. They'll make their way to the SEC. Um, you know, as an Albertan, I'm, I'm familiar with the Jim Keekstra case. Uh, Keistra was uh, an individual who was teaching Holocaust denial and anti-Semitism in small town central Alberta in the 1980s. Uh, he was also mayor of that town. Uh, it, it took 12 years from the time that he was charged to the time that his conviction was ultimately upheld 
through multiple appeals by the Supreme Court in 96. And ultimately, they did that by looking at what constitutes offensive speech that we don't like versus dangerous speech that uh, meaningfully impacts individuals, communities, and Canadian values. And I think that was an important distinction that came out of that case. Um, more recently, Bill Watcott, um, this was an individual who was distributing homophobic flyers in Regina in the early 2000s. Um, he had his conviction upheld seven years after he was charged um, by the Supreme Court of Canada. And at that time, they made um, an interesting statement because Watcott was similarly arguing, like Keekstra, that um, he had freedom of expression and freedom of religion or the freedom to express his religious belief and his opposition to uh, homosexuality. There he said, or the, sorry, the court said that Parliament's objective of preventing the harm caused by hate propaganda is of, is of sufficient importance to warrant overriding a constitutional freedom. So the point here is that the Supreme Court has created a growing body of jurisprudence that does place reasonable limits on freedom of expression and reinforces the importance of preventing harm to Canadians caused by hate. And we can use these historical decisions, we can use this jurisprudence to build this clear definition for police, for the Crown, for the Attorney Generals, and for the victims of hate in a manner that allows us to better address the problem. Okay, finally, the last point I'm gonna make here before turning things over to the, to the panel is related to data that we have at our disposal as, uh, as researchers, as policymakers, as academics, um, as you know, those of us who are, are wanting to, uh, to pursue prevention efforts um, around hate and hate crimes. Uh, some of you will be, or many of you will be, of course, aware of the very concerning numbers we have coming out of Stats Canada over the past decades. So, you know, during that time, during that decade, we have uh, police hate crimes ranging from about 1,100 uh, to 2,000 or a little more than 2,000 in 2017. We have a very uh, noticeable trend, especially since 2014, the steady, very concerning increase in numbers. Um, we know that on about a little less than half on average of those crimes involve acts of threat, acts or threats of violence, and that that violence is disproportionately impacting women, especially women from Muslim and racialized communities. So we know the numbers are concerning. We know the trend is in the wrong direction. But what you might not know is the picture is very incomplete. And to illustrate that, I'm just gonna point out two significant gaps. The first goes back to one of the you know, original points that I was making, and this is, this is hate online or, or cyber hate uh, crimes, where for seven years between 2010 and 2017, there were only 364 police reported hate crimes online in Canada, or a little more than 40 a year. So suffice it to say, instinctually, we know there's a significant underreporting of what's going on online, um, with some polls indicating that roughly 60% of Canadians are encountering hateful or racist speech online. And second, uh, and I would say more significantly, is the gap in data related to hate incidents targeting Indigenous populations, since we know from the most detailed 2018 data um, from Stats Canada that all hate incidents targeting First Nations, Métis, or Inuit peoples accounts for 2% of the total. 2% of the total. Um, is there anyone here among us who would contend that's an accurate number? Obviously it is not. And what this tells me quite clearly is we need to seriously consider how we can build greater awareness among our most marginalized communities on how and where they can safely report these incidents. Um, so just to summarize really quickly, these three gaps, first, better understanding of the mechanisms and networks that spread hate online, especially online. Uh, second, creating a standardized cross-Canadian definition of hate that can be used by the police, by the Crown, and by victims um, who they work with. And creating wider public awareness that focuses on encouraging reporting and reducing barriers to reporting, especially among racialized women and Indigenous populations. All of this will create the kind of tools and knowledge we need to make evidence-based decisions around a very challenging and important problem. And if we collectively as a society, if we want to take a whole of society approach here, which I think we, we need to, um, we need to create effective prevention. We need to create counter hate programming that is based in evidence. And certainly uh, we at the OPV are committed to this goal. 
We need those right tools. We need the right data, but we also need to fit those tools within a bigger goal that has to be to build a more uh, just and equitable multicultural society. I'm sure I'm over time. I will leave it there, but thank you very much. Thank you so much, John. Hi, everyone. Super honored to participate in this important event today to discuss hate, impacts, responses, and efforts to prevent it. I believe with the advent of recent global events such as the global uh, COVID-19 pandemic and with the rise of social media and new communication channels, just as John just presented to us, we are witnessing new forms of violence and hate and discrimination that threaten the core of our Canadian society and values. As such, we all have duties to understand what hate is, its impacts, and how to address it. In order to do that, I believe we need more events like this webinar, please, CPN Prev, that hugs practitioners with policymakers and experts and general public together to discuss in a multi-stakeholder way the hate speech phenomenon. In light of that, I would like to start by welcoming our experts today. Our panelists join us from different sectors, government and community. So welcome to Lisa Marie Inman, welcome to Peter Flegel, joining us from the government sector, and welcome to Dunya Noor and Irfan Chaudhry from the community sector. I will take a few moments to quickly introduce each panelist. Lisa Marie is currently the Director General of Multiculturalism and Anti-Racism at Canadian Heritage. She is responsible for multiculturalism and anti-racism policy and funding programs, including Canada's anti-racism strategy 2019-2022 and other important multiculturalism and anti-racism initiatives in the government. Welcome, Lisa. Peter is the Executive Director of the Government of Canada's Federal Anti-Racism Secretariat. In addition to coordinating federal action and driving the overall strategy, he and his team are responsible for working with federal departments and agencies to identify, coordinate initiatives, gaps, and consider the various impacts on communities and indigenous people. Thank you, Peter, and welcome. Dunya joins us from the African Canadian Civic Engagement Council. Dunya is currently the president of the African Canadian Civic Engagement Council, overseeing a team of policy and program officers responsible for conducting research, community mobilization, culturally tailored programming, and knowledge sharing between indigenous communities and communities of African descent. Hi, Dunya. <laughs> Welcome to our panel today. And last but not least, Arfan. Arfan is the director of the Office of Human Rights, Diversity and Equity at McEwen University. Arfan also serves as the vice president of the Canadian Association for the Prevention of Harassment and Discrimination in Higher Education. He is also a member of the Public Safety Canada Expert Committee on Countering Radicalization to Violence. Welcome Arfan. Welcome everyone and thank you for taking the time to be with us today. I would just like to give the floor to you, to our panelists today. Did I miss anything from, like, I really, sorry, I had a brief biography for each one of you. So please let me know if I missed anything before I put my interviewer hat on and start with my questions. Okay, <laughs> great. So since we have limited time today to cover such a huge topic, I have organized my questions to help guide our audience and our panelists to get the most actually of our experts today and meet our session objectives. As such, some questions will be specifically directed to our government experts, some other questions to the community sector panelists, like for example, Arfan and Dunya, and some to all. We have, I think, I believe around 40 minutes to do so. Our CPN team, uh, Daniela, will tell us if we are uh, good with time. And then we will give the floor for participants and audience contribution. That way we'll have an interactive session. Does that sound okay? Perfect. So I'll start with my first question. The first question is addressed to all experts on our panel today. Given the multiplicity of hate speech definitions that are circulating globally, given the fact that there is no international legal definition of hate speech, and the characterization of what is hateful is in itself controversial and disputable, I feel it's important to start by delineating or identifying what the phenomenon is about. So my first question to you today, how do you define hate speech? What is hate speech? For example, how does the federal government define hate speech? How do our community experts on our 
panel today define hate speech? Anyone is welcome to answer this question. I'll give the floor to my panelists now. Anyone who wishes to answer is welcome. Hi, it's Lisa Marie from, from Heritage. Uh, I'll jump in because no one else is. But uh, I think I'll just, I'll just start really briefly telling you about kind of what, we, what Peter and I do at Heritage, um, just to, also to highlight a couple things. So in terms of uh, dealing with hate and online hate and hate speech, et cetera, um, our team at Heritage, so Multiculturalism and Anti-Racism, which includes the Anti-Racism Secretariat, um, really deals with these things from a little bit of a different, uh, a different lens than, say, justice or public safety or our law enforcement counterparts. So um, our main, main goal, I suppose, is interacting with community to help identify the gaps that John had highlighted as well and to make suggestions, advise, uh, figure out where federal action is needed and sort of direct, I guess, resources, advice, et cetera, help towards those areas. So I think that the um, online hate in particular is definitely an issue of interest for the government. I know many different departments are working on it. Even within Heritage, um, our broadcasting colleagues do their own work on online hate in terms of working with ISAT, et cetera, on the regulation piece um, and you know how we're dealing with that in the online space. Uh, but in terms of what we do, uh, multiculturalism and anti-racism, I'm sorry, I'll try to be quick, but uh, as you mentioned, in 2019, we launched Building a Foundation for Change, uh, which is Canada's anti-racism strategy 2019 to 2022. It was organized along three pillars. So first, demonstrating federal leadership. And from that came the, the birth, I suppose, of the Secretariat, which is led by Peter, in terms of trying to coordinate government action in the sort of anti-racism space but also working with provinces, territories, and civil society groups in terms of, of moving some actions forward. Um, we're all aware that you know, it's not going to take three years. It may take 10 times that long or longer, but it was an important sort of first step to build the, the foundation for consistent, sustained action in these areas. Um, empowering communities is the second pillar, and that really pulls in our, uh, our funding program. So we do a lot of grants and contributions funding. Um, for various groups um, under two specific programs. So the Anti-Racism Action Program and the Community Support Multiculturalism and Anti-Racism Initiatives Program. Uh, so those are our funding programs. And the third was Building Awareness and Changing Attitudes. So, which is really our data and evidence piece. Uh, data and evidence, but also building public awareness products so that, um, so that ideas and the history of racism and the history of hate really can be can be better socialized so people understand where these things might come from. And from the, that was sort of at its, at its lowest level, sort of designed around the, the idea that uh, increased understanding can be helpful along the way. Um, in any case, uh, in coming up with the strategy, we had done um, about 22 engagements across the country, so those ministerial engagements. And I would say from having participated in them that online hate and hate speech in particular were things that came up repeatedly again and again. And uh, as John had pointed out, participants called across the board for a more consistent definition of hate. In, in our own work uh, on the anti-racism side, we do take a fairly broad definition of hate speech, uh, largely predicated on, on what God and the, the Supreme Court's um, judgment in that case in terms of exposing people to detestation or vilification on the basis of a prohibited ground of discrimination. So we tend to be fairly broad in terms of its application. If people are considering something as hate speech, then we want to talk to them. Um, so this was, this was raised sort of across the board at the various community sessions in terms of a consistent definition, uh, legal mechanisms that could be brought in to deal with hate speech, sort of hate in the non-criminal space. What do we have to address hate before it as John pointed out, the bar and the criminal code is quite high uh, in terms of hate crimes, but it doesn't mean that the things in the gray areas and on the margins shouldn't have some sort of response as well. So that, that's one of the things that we heard from folks and we continue to speak with our other government colleagues in terms of, uh, in terms of those issues. So I think that uh, I would agree with you that a consistent definition is necessary, both in terms of focusing our work and ensuring that everyone is addressing the same problem. Um, and one last thing, just in terms of online hate, uh, no matter how it's defined, um, 
our funding because of the, what we had heard in our engagement sessions in terms of online hate and people's concern around online hate, we did set aside specific pieces of funding uh, for sort of online hate and, and uh, digital literacy to a, to a degree uh, in terms of trying to help communities either address online hate uh, or address the impact of online hate or develop programming that could help uh, help members sort of confront things like that. We had also funded public safety in terms of hate crimes work, but, um, and one of the things that we were looking at there and that we continue to look at is exactly what John had pointed out, which is reducing the barriers to reporting. We know that there's probably an underreporting issue that's apparent, um, but what can we do to better place community members and target communities to be able to properly, you know, properly be engaged by law enforcement and otherwise and properly uh, be set up for success, I suppose, in, in being able to access the resources that may be most helpful. Sorry, I went on a very wide ranging answer to your question there, but, uh, and I, I suspect from now on, I mean, I'll, I'll probably generally mostly turn it over to Peter in terms of his on the ground work with anti-racism and, and hate, but uh, I will, thought someone should open it up. So uh, there you have it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for opening it up and like uh, for us to realize that it's not a simple uh, question that can be answered like uh, we know that hate is a, is, a, is a complex phenomenon and we need to treat it as such. So thank you for your valuable contribution. I'll give the floor now to Arfan, our panelist. Uh, would you like, I saw your hand raised. Yeah, no, thanks so much. Uh, and thanks uh, to John and uh, Lisa Marie for kind of providing that, that context. Um, you know, I think one of the pieces that you, we, we often try to understand with the definition around, you know, hate speech, uh, you know, and John, I think, articulated it quite nicely in his opening in terms of identifying the, the, the legal boundaries in Canada as, as we have it, because I think that's the, the biggest, you know, um, whether or not we're able to kind of come up with a consistent definition. And I saw in a, in a chat message there that, you know, one province has still been trying to come up with a consistent definition uh, with, you know, uh, some, some movement still to be made. I think it goes back to how uh, the legal boundaries, you know, regardless of definition, are still a, a fairly large, um, you know, uh, barrier in how we even address, you know, uh, hate speech and hateful speech and hateful narratives and things that might not hit the hateful threshold, but are still fueled by bias and discrimination. And, you know, one of the things that I often reflect on is when we're trying to make that definition around what is hate speech, it goes back to the values that we're trying to establish as, you know, a country. And so even if you look at the history of hate crime legislation in our country, you know, the, the, the you know, small number of specific hate crime related, you know, criminal code categories being a result of, you know, what happened in World War II and then, you know, developed in 1960s, 1970s. And then in the 1990s with, you know, sentencing provisions being added on. Uh, but we have really haven't had a chance to kind of, you know, dive into, you know, current aspects and, you know, societal changes as it relates to what might be considered hate speech based on our historical, you know, developing and building off our, our, our laws. And so I think in that regard, it goes back to the values that we're trying to articulate within a society. And I would argue over the last number of years, you know, the if you kind of look at it as a Venn diagram where you have like, you know, free speech as one circle, hate speech as the other circle, and then social values as a third circle where you're trying to find that that balancing ground. Um, the free speech aspect has likely been the more protected one, I would say, versus the hate speech aspect, because when you look at it in terms of, you know, what can be enforced, whether there are mechanisms in place that provide structure around guaranteeing free speech, then there is mechanisms to provide structure uh, and providing for flexibility and discretion around enforcing what could be considered hate speech, right? And so I think that's where I feel that regardless of the definition, because I do agree that a consistent definition is needed, uh, but those legal boundaries, I think, is what makes it even challenging in terms of how we address it from, from that regard. So um, that's kind of where I'm, I'm, I'm oftentimes struggling with the definition of, of hate speech, knowing that that consistent aspect is, is definitely needed, but also kind of the layers involved in terms of oh where God. we establish our value. Sorry, we'll just do a brief reminder for everyone to mute their microphones. Go yeah. ahead, Arfan, I'm sorry. Arfan, please go on. Thank you for mentioning no, no. the yeah. between, like the, what you're saying, yeah, no, the that was expression done and <laughs> the definition, it's such an important point. And I, 
So you actually made my job easier because then I don't have to mention it. You did. So thank you so much for your valuable contribution. That's uh, that's good that you highlighted this aspect. And now that leads me to my next question. Like we talked about how hate speech aims to denigrate or wishes to denigrate, hurt or eliminate your other just because they belong to certain community or religion or ethnicity, therefore undermining respect for minority groups and damaging social cohesion in our society. So that leads me to my next question. Why this hate, where does it come from? So this second question, Sonia and Arfan, in your opinion, what are the key causes and drivers for hate speech in our Canadian society? Yeah, I guess I can go first. Um, well, for me, when I think about this question, um, I feel like the person that answered it the best is the late Nansen Mandela. And uh, he says it very well. No one is born hating one another because of the color of their skin, their background, or his religion, people must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they could be taught to love for love comes naturally into the human heart, then it's opposite. So what that teaches me personally is that hate is a learned behavior and uh, it's also a perceived fear of, of the unknown. Uh, typically what I find, especially in my line of work and those that are victims, of various of different hate, whether it's hate speech or even physical violence, discrimination in the workplace, it really does come out in different ways. Um, what I find is there's always a perceived threat of uncertainty, there's intimidation, there's insecurity. Uh, John McCoy said it very well at times. What happens is, you know, it's sometimes. Um, read by politicians, people in power. Uh, there, there's process of hate when I think about, you know, the best way is, uh, the best definition as well is actually um, how hate, the process that hate takes place in terms of the 10 stages of genocide. So for example, the po polarization, dehumaniz dehumanization, stereotyping, stigma. So that just tells you how it starts, that there's a process way before at least the physical violence or, or anything that really disrupts, um, you know, humanity and, and public safety. So when I think about the causes of hate, uh, it's various, it's different uh, from culture to culture, but there are commonalities. But one thing that I could definitely say is it's a learned behavior that some, sometimes society nurtures, and we just have to find a creative way to disrupt that. In terms of the disruption component, I also feel that I look at it from an anti-oppression anti lens, which means that individuals and particular groups that are typically impacted by hate, oftentimes what we do is we put the responsibilities on them to solve the problem, to speak to their, like, speak into your personal experience and teaching the public as a form of public awareness in terms of the long-term impact of hate and trauma is something very important. But solving the problem of hate, particularly of those who, you know, pre uh, preach hate and even sometimes act upon hate should not be the responsibility of those that are impacted by hate. It should be a shared responsibility between the schools through their curriculum at an early, early stage in terms of introducing um, anti-racism curriculum. It should be the responsibility of the government from policy to legal you know, uh, definition across the nation. It should also be uh, the responsibility of policing and how serious they take that in terms of the reporting and the way they respond. Um, it should also be the responsibility of the community in terms of the advanced programs they put in place and um, you know how they respond to building strong, healthy, resilient community. So when I think about just in terms of that's on a prevention, uh, sorry, that's on an intervention level, but when I think about what is hate, I really just come to the conclusion that it's a learned behavior of dehumanization. And if we can learn it, we could definitely unlearn it. Thank you so much. Arfan, the floor is yours. Yeah, no, thanks so much, uh, Dunia, for kind of shaping it in that in that context as well. You know, I, I've been paying some attention to, you know, obviously yesterday was inauguration day, so there's been a lot of, you know, um, 
discussion and dialogue around how uh, the previous regime had really contributed to kind of some of those hateful narratives that were fueling, you know, uh, a lot of unfortunate things that we've seen, you know, not just in, in the States, but even how it's, you know, I can only speak about my province in Alberta, uh, how we've seen some of this impact, you know, uh, narratives of hate here in our own province. And I think one of the, the, the podcasts I was listening to about this last night that was kind of reflecting on you know, the use of social media and, you know, a game changer in the sense of, you know, Twitter, you know, removing the previous president from being able to access the information uh, and share points of views because it was challenging that freedom of expression piece for sure. But then also how uh, from this one reporter's perspective, there's been an observable kind of, you know, a very quick look, of course, we have to see how long it takes, but a very, very quick view from this reporter highlighting how even that misinformation and the use of fake news and the, and the use of fanning flames against identities has really been, you know, silenced to some degree because you don't have a loud vocal kind of, you know, outlier uh, saying and provoking things that, as we saw two weeks ago, led to the takeover of, uh, of, uh, of you know, uh, democracy, if you look at it very symbolically, right? And so I think when you look at some of those, you know, definitional aspects, those those motivations, you know, I, I like to think about right now in terms of how that online space is really starting to reaffirm and reframe, uh, you know, the challenges of, you know, where people get information from. I think COVID-19 has also created an interesting dynamic because more and more people following public health orders, you know, staying at home, not socializing in person, but then likely how that uh, lack of, you know, offline interaction leading folks to online interaction and now inadvertently might be leading folks down a rabbit hole in terms of ideology and ideas. Um, and so I think that's where when you look at it from the perspective of, of you know, where some of these ideas are formed and, and incubated, I think the narratives around social media right now, of course, you know, this is not new, uh, but those narratives, I think, are amplified even more now in terms of our current context. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, if, if, if we follow what we're saying, so again, we are giving ways to basically talking about hate speech and it's multi-layered with the fact that we have these new communication channels it's becoming a super complex phenomenon that is exhibited globally versus locally sometimes the differences in that and we touched base from our different questions on definitions uh, we Irfana and Dunya shared with us some causes and drivers but and we talked about a little bit of impact so now my next question is how do we deal with this? How do we address it and prevent it? So this is a question specifically to our government experts on our panel today. What is the federal government doing to address hate speech in Canada? How is our government dealing with the phenomenon and fighting against discrimination and hate in our society? Uh, so perhaps uh, I could uh, I could chime in here. And in, in thank you for the question and in answering the question, I'll try to also address uh, the two previous questions that, that you raised. So as Lisa Maria mentioned, uh, so the Federal Anti-Racism Secretariat uh, was created as part of the uh, demonstrating federal leadership pillar of Canada's anti-racism st uh, strategy. And it's really responsible for leading a whole of government approach uh, to combating systemic racism, uh, discrimination, and uh, notably working with uh, federal departments and agencies uh, to identify systemic barriers, uh, uh, gaps in programming services, legislation, and, and, and the like. Uh, but also um, spearhead or help to kick start with other departments new and responsive initiatives. And uh, from our perspective, to play that kind of key kind of whole of government role, we need to center the voices of communities that are directly affected uh, by racism. And so that's one of the reasons that we have been hosting uh, since COVID hit a series of uh, town halls with uh, South Asian communities, uh, East Asian communities, Black communities, Muslim, Jewish communities, uh, and Indigenous peoples, really to hone in on some of the, the critical uh, issues that are being em emerging, uh, notably under COVID-19, but also some identifying uh, some of the gaps uh, that may exist and, and what, what is necessary for the government to either course correct or it creates a better uh, policy uh, program services or legislation to respond to the needs. And so um, in, in those conversations, um, a lot of uh, some a lot of issues uh, were, were raised, uh, among others, uh, the issue of the definition. So we kind of discussed the high uh, legal threshold um, in terms of addressing hate crimes, but uh, there's also the high practical, if I can call it such, uh, threshold, notably working with law enforcement. Uh, so in addition to there being uh, no uh, no single uh, definition of hate crimes, 
There is also no single uh, format or, or setup for uh, law enforcement to have um, anti uh, anti uh, anti hate uh, units, and so many you know don't don't have anti hate units. So that's an issue. And even when they do, as the stakeholders have been telling us, um, they don't necessarily or always want to uh, you know acknowledge uh, that that an incident is a hate crime uh, for a variety of reasons. And this is something that we're hearing. Uh, so there's that practical piece. Uh, that's uh, that's significant, which kind of ties into the other another uh, significant piece that has been raised is the kind of data collection uh, piece. We do know that around 60%, according to an uh, association for Canadian studies, 60% of Canadians uh, who are victimized by hate crimes do not report uh, being victimized, and so that that demonstrates a, a non, a, you know a challenge not only definition but a, a, the a comfort level uh, and feeling safe in terms of raising. Uh, raising concerns about, you know, very violent um, and just dehumanizing um, experiences that are tied. Uh, tied. So that brings that brings uh, brings me to the next, the second question that you asked, which was regards to the roots of racism. And so, in building the Canada's anti-racism strategy, and then since in our conversations with uh, during town halls and uh, other kind of exchanges with stakeholders, we've heard that um, hate in Canada is really grounded in uh, centuries of white supremacy. And colonial colonializations, which uh, colonialization, which dispossessed indigenous peoples from their lands and and from much of their cultures and languages, and what we are experiencing today is a leftover of that history, whether it's slavery, colonization, the Indian residential schools, uh, the head tax for Chinese Canadians, and the list and the list really goes on. So that the federal government acknowledges through Canada's anti-racism strategy that systemic racism is embedded in our institutions, including our federal public institutions. And so that's where this critical work that needs to be done uh, to address it, and notably uh, its relationship uh, with, with hate. Uh, nonetheless, what we've witnessed, as you probably know, uh, over the last few years is that uh, hate and hate groups have been emboldened uh, for a variety of, of reasons. So there's been particular concern around that. And so that's why, among other things, in Canada's anti-racism strategy, we uh, very recently uh, announced a $15 million of funding for a variety of community organizations and other organizations across the country, some of which went to organizations working specifically on the area of hate, because we recognize that the expertise uh, in terms of addressing hate lies within communities that are directly targeted and affected. And so we do agree, Virginia, that um, uh, communities that are affected are, should not be expected uh, to be uh, the the solution, or not, or not necessarily the solution, but the ones that that lead lead. It's a collective effort, and and it requires kind of an interdisciplinary and multi sector um, effort, and that's what the federal government's recognizing. But nonetheless, we do acknowledge that the expertise lies with communities, and so that's why an organization like uh, the Canadian Anti Hate Network and, and others, uh, NCCM and others, have received funding to do um, that critical work. We've also been working. Uh, with our digital citizenship initiative to really hone in on anti-Asian racism, which has existed for you know decades, if not centuries, in Canada, but it's really come to the public fore with COVID-19, as we've seen horrible incidents um, across uh, across the country. So I think close to a million dollars was invested to support not only capacity building but uh, broad-based national campaigns against anti-Asian anti-Asian hate. Uh, the Can Canadian government has also um, added uh, neo-Nazi groups like Blood and Honor, Com Combat 18 to the list of terror organizations, recognizing that it's not only, as I think it was John that was recognizing, it's a, an individual threat, but um, as has been demonstrated um, south of the border, it's a collective, a, a collective a threat to national security, the health of our democratic institutions. And we know uh, from uh, you know media reports and uh, that there's a there's a possibility that Canadians may have been involved in that process and so uh, as many have pointed out it's important that we not as Canadians be smug because hate and hate groups are unfortunately a reality in Canada but we, we know we as I definitely do a salute and honor the incredible work that many people on this on this uh, zoom call and others across the country are playing really to create a hate uh, free Canada Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Lisa, would you like to add anything? Okay. 
then thank you so much for your thank you peter for your holistic answer for all the previous questions and for also highlighting the various initiatives the federal government is doing to address hate phenomenon in multi ways involving various stakeholders in the community and how it's dealing with the different challenges and to find solutions to it my next question is about the phenomenon and it's linked to the world and what the world has been going through lately so this question is addressed to all experts on our panel today do you think the recent global events, such as, for example, the COVID-19 pandemic, affected the hate speech phenomenon? And if so, should it or does it change our approaches or strategies to address and prevent it? Ayrfan, the floor is yours. Sure, yeah. No, I'll just kind of uh, briefly just kind of share, you know, I think, uh, 100% we have to kind of look at it in the context of what we're seeing right now. Uh, you know, whether it's, you know, hate incidents that get reported uh, that are, you know, uh, targeting, you know, specific communities uh, in terms of a, a unfair and inaccurate, you know, connection to COVID-19 and its spread. Uh, and I think there's, you know, another reminder of kind of the historical legacy that we have, as Peter had alluded to, around, you know, historical notions of racial discrimination against various communities in our country uh, that, you know, uh, Canada, we've done a really good job of promoting ourselves as a multicultural space, uh, but we also have done a very good job of hiding some of those things under the carpet that, that aren't, you know, very, very uh, inclusive. And, you know, hate crimes and hate incidents, you know, as, uh, you know, Dr. Bar Barbara Perry often says, is just a reminder of the disruption of, uh, of the mantra of multiculturalism, right? In terms of when we have these types of, you know, crimes and, and incidents that are motivated by hate or bias, uh, it, is, it is kind of a, a, a ugly reminder that we have a lot of work to do. And then so, again, just acknowledging the work that many around the call and many of the speakers are involved with, it, it's, uh, um, you know, impressive to kind of see that commitment going. And I think, you know, our current context is just a further reminder of the 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 immediacy of a lot of this, right? I know in the work that I've done in the past, you know, a lot of times the global events are the things that accelerate the work uh, more, more quickly. Um, you know, the Quebec mosque shooting is one that comes to mind. Uh, the New Zealand mosque shooting is another one that comes to mind where you saw a lot of community and nonprofit and also government organizations amplify their efforts around addressing hate, bias and discrimination. Uh, but I am also mindful that I, it, it shouldn't take, you know, uh, the death of many people for action to happen. And so I think this is just another reminder of the urgency and the immediacy and the, the reality. Like, you know, I have been reading, you know, you know, different comments on different spaces. And, you know, there's people that are taking more of a, a vocal point because, you know, li lives are at stake. If you really kind of break it down, it's no longer just ideas perspectives, ideologies, freedom of expression, freedom of speech, you know, those are aspects, you know, for consideration, but their lives at stakes as well. And so I think the stakes are much higher, uh, definitely uh, amplified by the current context as well. Thank you so much. Would any of our panelists like to answer that question? Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to add that um, the African Canadian Civic Engagement Council um, during the summer of 2020 conducted a groundbreaking research across Canada regarding how black communities experience COVID-19. And um, one thing that we found is that COVID-19 is significantly um, harming black communities disproportionately than the average Canadian uh, financially, physically, emotionally, and many black people also stated that across Canada, that they're three times more likely to know someone who has passed away from COVID-19, significant job loss, um, you know, pretty much also um, being exposed to, to COVID-19 reg regarding how they their transit to um, their jobs and so on and so forth and lack of accommodations, crowded housing spaces and so on and so forth. And that research just scratched the surface. It was community-based research between the African Canadian Civic Engagement Council and innovative research group. And that was really, really shocking. Shortly after, uh, what we did is also discrimination in Canada and how you know all Canadians experience um, uh, discrimination and like what they feel in terms of like their level of confidence regarding reporting to police or even feeling safe with policing in Canada. What we found is, which I'm just going to quickly link regarding the you know underreporting of the experience of hate crime. 
uh, a lot of Black people did not feel safe. And this is across Canada reporting to police regarding any matter. Um, a lot of Black people actually stated that they don't have hope within uh, Canada's court system. And this is a national research and predominantly the people that have responded are of African Caribbean and Black descent across Canada, Toronto, Montreal, Alberta, like all over. So that was very fascinating. Now, of course, it was a community-based research um, and we just scratched the surface and we didn't have an opportunity to talk about COVID and hate crimes. And that's what we're going to do right now with, as ASAC, we're trying to work with uh, John McCoy's leadership, OPV, and actually bring something together that talks about, okay, well, what is the experience of people of African descent and how they're living with COVID-19 and racism and discrimination and hate crime? Because what we found is that even in Edmonton, Alberta, the places that like has a high population of ethnocultural and black communities, COVID-19 is impacting them significantly. And as John mentioned, uh, a lot of racially motivated attacks are happening at the same time among individuals that have the intersections of being a Muslim, being a woman, being black. So it's very interesting. And we're hoping to you know, engage Canadians at a greater, larger scale um, as a grassroots organization with OPV and with innovative research as well. And hopefully what we want to do is give that data to public safety and, and you know, our provincial, municipal and federal government and say, okay, now we have, aside from anecdotal stories, we have concrete evidence that we want to change policies and put specific programming that is in place. Thank you so much. Uh, would any of our panelists like to add anything to what um, Donia just told us or would like to respond to this question or any other question before we open the floor to the audience? Lisa, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just jump in quickly to you to say uh, not anything different. I think we've seen sort of the, uh, the same just general activity of the pandemic as exacerbating barriers that are already felt by our sort of racialized religious minority and indigenous communities. Um, so our research has shown that there are particular racialized communities that have been suffering more than other communities during the pandemic. So that's one of the things that we're looking at. But I wanted to kind of, in the context of this question, talk, touch on something that I had seen in the chat, just in terms of um, the the impact of fear on uh, and fear and its role in propelling hate speech. But I think that one of the things that we've seen as well during the pandemic is the um, sort of the ability or the the tactic of extremist groups to really kind of leverage that fear and misunderstanding of, of the pandemic and of what's happening. Um, so almost weaponizing those places that, that are less understood in order to drive hate speech and hate sentiment. So that's something that, we, that we've that we noticed as well. Um, and just, so I think that in, in terms of that, fear does have a big space. I think that in any space where there's a lack of information or there's a particular amount of fear, there is an ability for people to sort of exploit that gap. And so for bad actors to come in and exploit that place where there's not enough information about something, um, exploit it to their own ends and use it to drive that kind of sentiment. So uh, we had seen that sort of early on. And I will say that as part of the Government of Canada's response to, to COVID that uh, the government did invest for, and I think Peter might have already mentioned this, but again, just to say that they did, uh, the the specific funding uh, allocated through the Digital Citizenship Initiative was in large part because those types of things were seem to, seem to be increasing. There was a need to increase people's understanding around those issues to be able to counter some of the, uh, some of the misinformation about the pandemic that was often manifested uh, even more strongly in hate speech and uh, hateful comments against particular groups. So I think in helping to combat the false and misleading COVID-19 information, uh, in some sense, you're also attacking or, and confronting hate speech that grows up around that particular gap in understanding. So sorry, that's just all I had to add. Thank you so much. Uh, Arfan, the floor is yours. Yeah, no, thanks. And just, just to kind of pick up uh, on that question in the chat there in terms of, you know, um, fear, hate, and, you know, there's an interesting diagram, you know, you can find this fear, hate, ignorance kind of fueling in together. And I think that's why you've seen, you know, a number of even different social media platforms, you know, during the pandemic also increase their uh, ability to, you know, provide better, you know, 
cautions and even warnings around, you know, false information that's out there. So some of you might notice on Instagram now, for example, if a post even contains the word, you know, COVID-19 on there, uh, there's a direct link to some, you know, credible sources around, you know, COVID-19 to ensure the appropriate information is being directed to people. Uh, and then also on Twitter, I noticed, like, I was guilty of this, that's where I noticed it, is, you know, I was going to retweet something that I had uh, seen from, I think the CBC had shared something that I wanted to retweet. And again, guilty of just reading the headline, it aligned with my values, I'm like, cool, I'm going to retweet it, no problem. Uh, as I was retweeting it, I got this prompt that said, hey, you know, we noticed, and I'm paraphrasing, but it said, hey, we noticed that you didn't read the article that you're about to share. Do you want to maybe take a second to read through it before you post it? Uh, and so I'm noticing more and more, uh, you know, automated ways that uh, some of the social media platforms are trying to regulate, you know, where you might have that connection around, you know, uh, misinformation that fuels into fear mongering that could lead to potentially offline, you know, acts of hate, whether incidents or crime, uh, as a result of what's being, you know, manifested uh, online. I just finished a, a fairly large scale study uh, uh, looking at uh, rebel media uh, uh, YouTube comments. So I have to kind of clean my eyes <laughs> after all of this. Uh, but it was really interesting in terms of how you do see how quickly and quite easily misinformation gets shared within some of the comment sections and how easily it's consumed without anyone challenging anything. Uh, and that's again, where you have that as a narrative, uh, it gets shared not only just on, you know, social media platforms. Now people are sharing it within their own kind of, you know, WhatsApp chats or Telegram chats or, you know, other encrypted messaging apps where uh, it's being taken as face value. And, you know, one example, you know, many, many politicians right now have been kind of, you know, caught, you know, traveling when they were telling others not to. And, you know, there's uh, something that was circulating around some of these groups over that same time frame about Justin Trudeau saying he was in like the Barbados or something like that. And people were trying to share it and were wondering, oh, why is this not getting any attention? Only to find that that was a dated article that was being circulated in the context of, of what was happening right now. And so whether it's dates, whether it's timeframes, whether it's information, I think it's so easy for the cycle of, of uh, social media uh, to, to share and consume and, you know, retweet, you know, like, post, whatever you might do. I don't know what the equivalent of TikTok is. I don't use TikTok, but TikToking, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, it's important for those types of aspects now for us as digital consumers of information to be, you know, informed. And I think a good reminder is social media platforms, they still have a lot of work to do for sure. But I think acknowledging that we maybe can't trust the users to be, you know, informed on everything at all points in time, providing safety mecha mechanisms and reminders and prompts as a way to try to dissuade some of the misinformation that's out there that could uh, have an impact on bias, discrimination, uh, and, you know, other forms of hateful resources. So I just wanted to kind of add, add to that as well. No, thank you for your very valuable contribution. Actually, like one of the questions that uh, shared by my team that was uh, in, the, in the chat that I find in a, you responded to it a little bit. So I'm just going to read it out loud to see if any of the panelists would like to also respond to it. So one of our participants today is saying, I'd like to explore a bit more about the relationship between fear and hate and how we might try to deal with the fear that is at least one of the contributing factors to hate. So Arfan alluded a little bit about it and we talked about social media and the importance of verifying uh, where the contributions come from and if they're valid. Would any of our panelists like to talk anything else about or comment on fear aspects? In the... Yes, Dunya, thank you, go ahead. I just wanted to quickly add one thing that I have noticed is when you look at times of recession or you know global pandemics or anything that has to do with a, you know net, like um global, anything that is like affecting large groups of people, typically what happens is instead of being, how do I say, trying to figure out a way to appropriately solve that social issue, what I find is instead people just go for a loophole of scapegoating. <clears throat> Quite so often the people that experience scapegoating are people that historically have been marginalized and if you look throughout our, our history, you're going to see that in times of genocide and in times of, you know, um, 
when it comes to colonization or slavery, the propaganda message was always around scapegoating, to take the compassion out of the equation, to dehumanize people, to polarize them, to stereotype them, to isolate them, and then build that public tension that also speaks to that is the problem when really, you know, that particular group might not be the problem. So I think that in the case of uh, crisis, whether it's, you know, a global pandemic, whether it's recession, whether it's natural disasters, whatever it is, one thing that I found is that hate, like the, just tying the act of hate crimes and fear, it's always through scapegoating. So, and I think that's something that we significantly need to address. Who can take the blame since we're all going through this massive trauma and we collectively are in pain and we don't have adequate mechanisms to figure out what moving forward and a path for healing means. Therefore, we will scapegoat and put the blame because that's so much more easier to do. And historically, unfortunately, uh, even Canada was a victim of, sorry, was also doing this at times, so. Thank you so much. Uh, today. Could I say a bit more about uh, that? because that question about fear and hate was uh, mine. I really appreciate the comments you've just made. Those, uh, those were very helpful about scapegoating. What, and, and I think, I mean, we've, we've talked a lot, at least indirectly, about how to interrupt that process from fear and ignorance to hate and then hate speech. But my fear is that if we don't deal with the causes of the underlying fear, we're going to continue to have to um, try to interrupt it much later on. And I think at least one of the causes of the fear is a genuine uh, observation among less educated white people that they're losing opportunities and that the economy is no longer uh, in their favor as much as it was before. And the, the problem is that their anger is directed at groups who are convenient and who they may have heard about and who they seek to blame rather than addressing the underlying cause of global capitalism, neoliberalism, uh, government's favor for... Um, uh, offshoring, manufacturing, um, all, all the other <clears throat> things that have led to income uh, inequality and indeed increasing income inequality and fewer options uh, for uneducated people uh, besides uh, Walmart greeters or uh, uh, even more precarious uh, uh, service industry jobs. So, I mean, I, I, I know there's lots more that, uh, that elevates fear into organized hate groups, but my fear, in quotes, is that if we don't uh, deal with underlying causes, we're always going to be fighting this rear guard action to try to uh, uh, overcome scapegoating and uh, stopping the proliferation of hate speech and uh, trying to uh, deal through the criminal justice system with those who, uh, for whom it, it escalates to acts of violence against vulnerable people. Thank you so much, Martin, for your valuable contribution and for your point. Uh, I will now select, can you hear me properly? Like, like I got some messages that my internet is unstable, so I apologize in advance. Um, I'm going to select a question from the speakers, from, from the chat. So it, it is as follows. Do you think hate, racially motivated crimes that come from hate speech or online harassment 
don't hold enough weight in our justice system as opposed to a crime that has caused physical harm, for example, death or attack. So is, this is the first question. I can continue exactly what the participant said maybe because there are many questions in this comment and perhaps we can answer it later on. Is this why law enforcement governmental agencies have a difficult time controlling issues of this nature? So meaning like uh, if the actual uh, crime has caused physical harm versus hate speech or online harassment. And then it says, is this why uh, getting police to place charges for hate speech is harder because of the freedom of speech argument? I don't know if this is clear enough to our participants. Yes, great. Thank you, Arfan. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. And I'll just I'll just uh, put a, a context there that um, I, I read that question earlier. And so I did put a, a link to uh, a document um, that the government of Canada prepared about uh, a year and a half ago. And it really outlines quite clearly the legal boundaries within hate speech and freedom of speech. And, you know, I've had I've had, uh, you know, I've had a chance to kind of interact with a number of law enforcement professionals uh, throughout Canada who are involved in, you know, uh, the investigation of hate crimes. And, you know, one of the things they often will will share is, is you know, the, the challenges around, you know, uh, the, the, the kind of legal definitions uh, and then the challenges around, you know, uh, Section 2 of the Charter. Uh, and then also, I think, as the question alludes to in terms of when there isn't that physical act of violence where, you know, other aspects of the criminal code could be could be categorized and utilized. And then Section 71828AI could be considered after, which is the hate crime uh, sentencing provision. Uh, that's where it becomes very, very challenging. Right. And so, you know, from my own observations, from whether it's in Ontario, whether it's in B.C., whether it's in Alberta, you know, uh, you know, everywhere across the country. Uh, it goes back to some of those issues we were talking about earlier, right? Because we we have a, a lack of a consistent definition, let's say, around hate speech. I would argue the same for, for hate crime. If you look at every police service's kind of definition, they're fairly similar, uh, but there isn't a consistent one. And so you'll see some police services, for example, define hate crime as, you know, a real... Uh, threat motivated by hate bias that hits that criminal threshold. Other police services use that uh, definition of real or perceived. And I share that because that real or perceived distinction is very, very important because that provides more discretion from a, a police officer's perspective to utilize kind of, you know, their their background, their training in the area to look at it and consider it from the hate crime perspective. And so I think, you know, in addition to those questions, you know, that's where I observe some of the, the layers and the challenges. Um, and, you know, just going back to even what, what John had mentioned earlier, right, in terms of the way our laws are set up right now, you know, I always I always am reminded, you know, I, I still remember to this day, I did a presentation for, for Edmund Police Service around hate crimes in the city and, you know, did the presentation to all the, the, the leaders and the chief. And, you know, after the chief kind of said, you know, yeah, thanks, thanks for this. But, you know, I always just have to remind, you know, everyone that police can only get involved if a crime has occurred. Right. And I think that, of course, is very, very obvious for them to say. But I think it's also a reminder sometimes for, for us uh, that aren't as actively involved in law enforcement to really understand, you know, OK, there are certain gaps that we have to be mindful of, you know, as communities, let's say, that are trying to address uh, hate in its various ways. And I think being able to articulate and understand how those those gaps within, you know, let's say legislation sometimes do make it look like police aren't, you know, doing something uh, when maybe legislation wise, they aren't able to do anything. Right. And so I think that's one context that I, I keep in mind. Uh, but then I've also seen, you know, I, I'm still coming to an example that happened over uh, the summer here in Alberta uh, at, a, at a, a protest between, you know, very varying sides of the spectrum and a visible, you know, interview by an RCMP member uh, to the reporter, you know, when they asked, why did you not intervene in such and such a way? Uh, the officer's response was, well, are you, are you suggesting that one side is more important than the other or one viewpoint is more important than the other? And I think that really challenged uh, individuals to see how discretion plays a really strong role in a lot of this. And so I think that's what makes it a little bit uh, a really complex, you know, question to answer because of the complexities that are that are there, but really, really good question for sure. Absolutely. Thank you. I would like to give the floor to any of our panelists if they would like to answer that question before turning to Frederick uh, from our audience who raised his hand. Uh, Peter, uh, Dunya, Lisa, Marie, does anyone have to, anything to say? Okay, Frederick, the floor is yours. 
Okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, for being here and participating. Um, actually, my point is going to build directly on Irfan's last point in terms of where the gap is in terms of the prevention of ultimately that violent extremism. So first, a quick frame around what I do. Uh, I work with a security consulting firm whereby we build uh, clients uh, security programs, we do threat risk assessments, and we help clients understand what that extremism picture looks like. And I'm talking across the spectrum, whether left-wing extremism, right-wing extremism, political, religious, everything across the spectrum. One of the things that we're missing and that we is, uh, is clearly better done in the US Example, the Anti-Defamation League. Uh, somebody else uh, um, shared a link on the Southern Poverty uh, Law Center. We don't seem to have um, in Canada a compendium of the symbology that is attached to hate groups. So if I'm talking right-wing extremism, white supremacy, neo-Nazis, etc., right? We don't seem to have a compendium for that. And that makes the job of educating our clients and educating the public much more difficult so that they can take their own prevention measures. Because Erfan was right, I've worked with law enforcement as well. They are very limited in terms of what they can do, um, you know, short of an actual crime being committed. So this is where the security picture comes in and people having the situational awareness and the education to look in their environment, to look inside in organizations, look at their own employees. What are the symbology being used? We can look at videos, say, from um, the Washington DC uh, insurrection that we had. We can look at videos across Canada of different uh, uh, demonstrations, the Manifestation à Montréal, all those ones. Different groups, Antifa, Combat 18, Blood and Honor, Proud Boys, uh, you know, et cetera. Uh, they're adapting symbology that is prevalent in the United States. Example, uh, the, the Triscally, right? There's a, there's a symbol going on of the three sevens with Canadian colors and cut up a certain way, right? Politically, we know that the right wing, right wing extremists have a well-developed um, not coordinated approach, but a lot of it is individual, but there's a campaign out there to infiltrate mainstream political parties and to see the kind of commentary that's been going on in the last week as well around, around the Conservative Party. So my interest here is very, very practical in nature, is how do we provide these additional tools uh, and I think we need to build a compendium of hate symbology that is specific to Canada. Uh, the, so your uh, question, sorry, Frederick, to cut you off, but in sake of time, can you tell me what your question is so that we address it to the panelists? So you said, what are, can you, can you repeat that? Yeah, absolutely. So m m I'm throwing it out to the group. Yes. Do we have such a compendium? Because I'm not finding one so far. And then do we have the ability as a network to perhaps start building something that the public can use that is short of classified information that the government will not be able to share? Thank you so much. Uh, our panelists, uh, anyone would like to answer Frederick's question? So sorry, it's nice for me. Um, just from heritage. So just uh, from a government pr government perspective, um, I think we were wel welcoming similar projects as part of our anti-racism action program and the funding for it. And uh, Irfan had posted uh, had highlighted this in the chat. So I'm sort of building off uh, what he had said. But um, there, so there are interesting civil society groups who've come forward in terms of seeking funding for these types of initiatives. And uh, you'll see in our October announcement that we did fund the Canadian Anti-Hate Anti Network for something that was, uh, that's, that's fairly similar, I suppose. That's sort of to increase the organization's capacity to counter online hate um, and carry out monitoring of extreme right groups, report on their activities and file complaints with law enforcement. So it's work that they're already doing. And, and um, that's the, the type of thing that, uh, that we can support as a government in terms of um, funding for groups that are willing to take on these works uh, and 
perhaps with the increased funding that we've received and going forward, we'll see more and more of these types of groups step up to be able to do some of that work that you're right, we do see from a, a number of different groups across the spectrum in the, in the state. So um, thank you for the question. I think it's, it's, it is an important flag um, just in terms of how much more there is yet to do in terms of building a, a knowledge base and an ability base and uh, just sort of across the spectrum. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, and maybe I'll, I'll just I'll just add. Sorry, sorry. I'll just add real quick. Thanks, thanks for sharing uh, that, uh, Frederick, as well. Um, uh, if you want to even connect offline, there's a number of Twitter accounts that are kind of serving that you know uh, role right now uh, outside of that formal kind of website. Um, and so, yeah, just I'd be happy to kind of connect with you and you know provide some of those those resources because I, I often find them to be quite valuable. Uh, a lot of times they are diving into people's you know the symbolism but then also the backgrounds behind uh, individuals that are promoting, you know, an angle of peace. But when you dive into them, they have a history of like Islamophobia, uh, let's say. And so, yeah, that's definitely a, a huge gap we have. But I found some Twitter accounts are, are filling the gap for sure in the Canadian context. So we can definitely connect and I can share some links. Thank you so much. Uh, anyone from our panelists would like to add anything? Okay, great. Uh, before I give the floor actually to uh, our director, Raida and, and Mike, to wrap things up today, I just want to thank you all. And I want to ask you if we can take a group picture, all of us, uh, before we, we go, because just to commemorate and have more events like that, we need to be able. So I'll ask Daniela, our CPN Prev team member, to help us take a group picture of everyone. And you tell us, Daniela, when, when it's taken. Perfect. So I'd encourage everyone. Hi, everyone. I'm Daniela. Everyone who's comfortable to turn on their cameras, I'll just take a quick, a quick screenshot. I'll just wait, give a little, everyone a little bit of time. Okay, we are a lot, so I will be taking several screenshots. For, here goes the first one. There it is. You want a face or a profile? Like, should we turn or? <laughs> I think uh, just like that, we are over 100, so coordinating everyone will be a bit difficult. Okay, I'm going for a second one. One, two, three. Thank you. Here it goes. One last one. Perfect. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much, Daniela. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for turning your cameras on. Like, I feel it's such important, uh, th these kind of initiatives and these kind of events, that's how it's going to make our way to deal with the phenomenon easier, is by the going and like going all the way with a multi-stakeholder, everyone involved. So thank you so much, and uh, I, I will give the floor back to our director, Raida. The floor is yours. Sure, thank you. So again, uh, I'm very happy. This has been a very, very dynamic and uh, very uh, important points, really, at all levels that have been highlighted. And uh, what I appreciate is also the directness and non-politically correct <laughs> Um, you know, courage of addressing uh, the phenomenon from both uh, our government uh, representatives, Heritage Canada representatives and the community, uh, you know, activists and actors and academic as well are fun, I have to say. So a lot of, uh, I want to thank also the public uh, for being here, also for all the notes and comments. I have noted several resources that uh, we will kind of collect in a document and probably post that on our social media platforms, on our website, so that if you wish to, to access uh, these, uh, these resources, you are more welcome. I do personally hope that this is just the start uh, of a numerous set of meetings, but given my activist and practical side of meetings that will lead us to, to kind of a clearer, more uh, efficient actions to address a phenomenon that's really becoming quite problematic and quite, uh, you know, quite uh, dangerous to the peace fabric uh, in this country. And I think that all of you have highlighted 
uh, the intersection actually of fear, you know, and the, and the fear mongering and the use of fear actually to manipulate uh, based on profound insecurities that Mar Martin or Martin has, has highlighted, you know, in bringing us back to the root causes, the silencing of all mid, like of in-between voices. So just highlighting polarized extreme voices and underrepresenting and silencing everybody who's actually calling for solidarity and calling for maintaining uh, peace and, you know, fighting for hate. And of course, the highly catalyzing role of social media and the internet. And I think we need, <laughs> probably we need a specific webinar, maybe calling for those high tech <laughs> companies to sit and answer <laughs> the questions that we have for them, because a lot has to be done. Uh, and I want to thank OPV also, Mike and John, uh, because you have been working actively with us. I want to deeply thank our panelists. And John, the floor is to you if you wish to, to just say a couple of words and uh, before we uh, bid our panelists and participants uh, a good day. Yeah, well, well, thank you very much. I'll just reiterate a lot of what Haida said. Um, I think it was a very good exchange, uh, a very reasonable exchange of uh, opinions and a lot of knowledge brought to the table by the panelists and uh, members who have come to um, contribute as well or, or members of the audience that have come to contribute as well. So I just wanted to say thank you very much. Um, Mike, did you have something you wanted to, to add there? Not really, just uh, my thanks as well to everyone, um, especially the, the panelists who uh, have, uh, of course, prepared for this, taken time out of their busy schedules to, to join us and talk about their work and, and, and their openness. And to everyone who's attended, you know, it's, it's really because of your attention and then your engagement and participation. That, that's what really makes it interesting. So thank you to everyone. And don't forget to join CPN Prev or just keep in touch. Uh, we always have tools and trainings and, uh, and webinars. Um, so please do reach out as well if ever you, you need any form of support as well. CPN is a network of practitioners. So we are connected to practitioners who offer support to individuals who may need and communities who may need help.